18. When a raven happens to croak unluckily, don't allow the appearance hurry you away with it, but immediately make the distinction to yourself, and say, None of these things are foretold to me, but either to my paltry body, or property, or reputation, or children, or wife. But to me, all omens are lucky, if I will. For whichever of these things happens, it is in my control to derive advantage from it. 19. You may be unconquerable if you enter into no combat in which it is not in your own control to conquer. When, therefore, you see anyone eminent in honors or power or in high esteem on any other account, take heed not to be hurried away with the appearance, and to pronounce him happy. For, if the essence of good consists in things in our own control, there will be no room for envy or emulation. But for your part, don't wish to be a general, or a senator, or a consul, but to be free. And the only way to do this is a contempt of things not in our own control. 20. Remember that not he who gives ill language or a blow insults, but the principle which represents these things as insulting. When, therefore, any one provokes you, be assured that it is your own opinion which provokes you. Try, therefore, in the first place, not to be hurried away with the appearance, for if you once gain time and respite, you will more easily command yourself. 21. Let death and exile, and all other things which appear terrible, be daily before your eyes, but chiefly death, and you will never entertain any abject thought, nor too eagerly covet anything. 22. If you have an earnest desire of attaining to philosophy, prepare yourself from the very first to be laughed at, to be sneered by the multitude, to hear them say, He has returned to us a philosopher all at once, and whence this supercilious look? Now, for your own part, don't have a supercilious look indeed, but keep steadily to those things which appear best to you as one appointed by God to this station. For remember that, if you adhere to the same point, those very persons who at first ridiculed will afterwards admire you. But if you are conquered by them, you will incur a double ridicule. 23. If you ever happen to turn your attention to externals, so as to wish to please anyone, be assured that you have ruined your scheme of life. Be contented, then, in everything with being a philosopher, and, if you wish to be thought so likewise by anyone, appear so to yourself, and it will suffice you. 24. Don't allow such considerations as these distress you. I will live in dishonor and be nobody anywhere. For, if dishonor is an evil, you can no more be involved in any evil by the means of another than be engaged in anything base. Is it any business of yours, then, to get power, or to be admitted to an entertainment? By no means. How, then, after all, is this a dishonor? And how is it true that you will be nobody anywhere, when you ought to be somebody in those things only which are in your own control, in which you may be of the greatest consequence. But my friends will be unassisted. What do you mean by unassisted? They will not have money from you, nor will you make them Roman citizens. Who told you then that these are among the things in our own control, and not the affair of others? And who can give to another the things which he has not himself? Well, but get them, then, that we too may have a share. If I can get them with the preservation of my own honor and fidelity and greatness of mind, show me the way, and I will get them. But if you require me to lose my own proper good, that you may gain what is not good, consider how inequitable and foolish you are. Besides, which would you rather have, a sum of money, or a friend of fidelity and honor? Rather assist me, then, to gain this character than require me to do those things by which I might lose it. 
Well, but my country, say you, as far as depends on me, will be unassisted. Here again, what assistance is this you mean? It will not have porticos, nor baths of your providing. And what signifies that? Why, neither does a smith provide it with shoes, or a shoemaker with arms. It is enough if every one fully performs his own proper business. And, were you to supply it with another citizen of honor and fidelity, would not he be of use to it? Yes. Therefore, neither are you yourself useless to it. What place, then, say you, will I hold in the state? Whatever you can hold with the preservation of your fidelity and honor. But, if by desiring to be useful to that, you lose these, of what use can you be to your country when you are become faithless and void of shame? 25. Is any one preferred before you at an entertainment, or in a compliment, or in being admitted to a consultation? If these things are good, you ought to be glad that he has gotten them. And if they are evil, don't be grieved that you have not gotten them. And remember that you cannot, without using the same means which others do, to acquire things not in our control, expect to be thought worthy of an equal share of them. For how can he who does not frequent the door of any great man, does not attend him, does not praise him, have an equal share with him who does? You are unjust, then, and insatiable, if you are unwilling to pay the price for which these things are sold, and would have them for nothing. For how much is lettuce sold? Fifty cents, for instance. If another, then, paying fifty cents, takes the lettuce, and you, not paying it, go without them, don't imagine that he has gained any advantage over you. For, as he has the lettuce, so you have the fifty cents which you did not give. So, in the present case, you have not been invited to such a person's entertainment, because you have not paid him the price for which a supper is sold. It is sold for praise. It is sold for attendance. Give him then the value, if it is for your advantage. But if you would at the same time not pay the one and yet receive the other, you are insatiable and a blockhead. Have you nothing then instead of the supper? Yes, indeed you have. The not praising him whom you don't like to praise. The not bearing with his behavior at coming in. 26. The will of nature may be learned from those things in which we don't distinguish from one another. For example, when our neighbor's boy breaks a cup or the like, we are presently ready to say, these things will happen. Be assured, then, that when your own cup likewise is broken, you ought to be affected just as when another's cup was broken. Apply this in like manner to greater things. Is the child or wife of another dead? There is no one who would not say, This is a human accident. But if any one's own child happens to die, it is presently, Alas! How wretched am I! But it should be remembered how we are affected in hearing the same thing concerning others. 27. As a mark is not set up for the sake of missing the aim, so neither does the nature of evil exist in the world. 28. If a person gave your body to any stranger he met on his way, you would certainly be angry. And do you feel no shame in handing over your own mind to be confused and mystified by anyone who happens to verbally attack you? 29. In every affair, consider what precedes and follows, and then undertake it. Otherwise, you will begin with spirit, but not having thought of the consequences, when some of them appear, you will shamefully desist. I would conquer at the Olympic Games. But consider what precedes and follows, and then, if it is to your advantage, engage in the affair. You must conform to rules, submit to a diet, Refrain from dainties, exercise your body, whether you choose it or not, at a stated hour in heat and cold. You must drink no cold water, nor sometimes even wine. In a word, you must give yourself up to your master as to a physician, 
Then, in the combat, you may be thrown into a ditch, dislocate your arm, turn your ankle, swallow dust, be whipped, and, after all, lose the victory. When you have evaluated all this, if your inclination still holds, then go to war. Otherwise, take notice, you will behave like children who sometimes play like wrestlers, sometimes gladiators, sometimes blow a trumpet, and sometimes act a tragedy when they have seen and admired these shows. Thus, you too will be at one time a wrestler, at another a gladiator, now a philosopher, then an orator, but with your whole soul nothing at all. Like an ape, you mimic all you see, and one thing after another is sure to please you, but is out of favor as soon as it becomes familiar. For you have never entered upon anything considerately, nor, after having viewed the whole manner on all sides, or made any scrutiny into it, but rashly, and with a cold inclination. Thus some, when they have seen a philosopher and heard a man speaking like Euphrates, though indeed who can speak like him, have a mind to be philosophers too. Consider first, man, what the matter is, and what your own nature is able to bear. If you would be a wrestler, consider your shoulders, your back, your thighs, for different persons are made for different things. Do you think that you can act as you do and be a philosopher, that you can eat and drink and be angry and discontented as you are now? You must watch, you must labor, you must get the better of certain appetites, must quit your acquaintance, be despised by your servant, be laughed at by those you meet, come off worse than others in everything, in magistracies, in honors, in courts of judicature. When you have considered all these things round, approach if you please. If by parting with them you have a mind to purchase apathy, freedom, and tranquillity. If not, don't come here. Don't, like children, be one while a philosopher, then a publican, then an orator, then one of Caesar's officers. These things are not consistent. You must be one man, either good or bad. You must cultivate either your own ruling faculty or externals, and apply yourself either to things within or without you. That is, be either a philosopher or one of the vulgar.